and we did not use any epsilons and deltas. Woo! <laughs> You'll see what I mean. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Payam. Alright, thanks for coming everyone. And by popular demand, today I will prove the fundamental theorem of calculus. It says Payam. I like pi. And then here we have the fundamental theorem of calculus, part two. I will not prove it in full generality, but I will prove a slightly more special case, namely the following one. And as I said, this is slightly more specific than the regular FTC because regular FTC says integral from a to b of f of x, you know, s is equal to an antiderivative of f at b minus an antiderivative of f at a. This assumes that f is differentiable. And we also need to assume that f prime is continuous. That says, with this formulation, we have a very, very elegant proof that does not use any epsilons and deltas. And to do this, we will, we'll use a, you know, a little trick, and you'll see what I mean. Hint, mean, okay? <laughs> we'll use another trick. But for this, also by popular demand, let me remind you how a Riemann integral works. So recall, maybe in the ironic sense, what Riemann integration is. And it just follows in a bunch of steps. The first step is to divide up the interval a from b, from a to b, okay, into n steps. So fix n, some inter positive integer, and chop the interval a to b into n pieces. So think of a very linear cake, and you want to split it into n pieces. And each piece has the same size. So the point is, because you're chopping off the interval a to, from a to b into n pieces, well, each piece will have length. So each piece has length. Well, the total length of the interval, b minus a, but divided by n, because you're splitting it up into n pieces. And we'll call this delta x, like a small change in x. Here you have one piece of length delta x, you know, and then here you have another piece of length, length delta x, etc, etc. And before we continue, I need to introduce a little bit of notation, and I'm sorry, there's a, no, so some notation is problem. Notation. First of all, the first point A, we call this x naught. Why not x naught, okay? x naught is A. And then the next point, we call it x1. And what is x1? Is a plus this little piece. So a plus delta x. The next point, we call it x2. What is it? So a plus delta x plus delta x. So a plus 2 delta x, etc., etc. The ith point will be xi is a plus i delta x, okay? And just as a sanity check, well, the last point we'll call it xn. Well, let me show that, you know, that I'm great. Let me show that the notation does work, because what is xn? Okay, so it's a plus n delta x. That's a plus n times b minus a over n. Cancels out, you know, bang, bang, into the room, you know, and then a plus b minus a, cancel this out, and you in fact get a, a b. So uh, the point is, the rightmost point actually corresponds to b. That's good news. Okay, that's the first thing. We chopped off the interval into n pieces, and now the second step is to consider rectangles. So on each piece, Let's call it xi minus 1 and xi. So here the 
index is i minus 1. Okay. So we have this sub cake if you want. xi, xi. And again, here you also have the graph of f prime. What do we want to do? On each piece, we just choose a random point, xi star. Okay. Choose a point. Liking, so in fact, you can choose whatever you want. So, you know, some people they like the left, so they put choose this point to be xi minus 1. Other people they choose the right, you know, they choose the point xi. Some people they like a balance, they just choose the midpoint, and other people they're like two thirds here, they choose this one. You can choose any point, that's fine. But the, the point, no pun intended, is that once you choose the xi star, you consider a certain rectangle. A rectangle of height, f prime xi star, and of width, this, this length here. So maybe this rectangle here. Okay. So choose a point xi star and consider the rectangle of height height f prime of xi star and width the width is precisely the length of this piece but remember the length of this piece is just delta x so m We get this rectangle, which it's supposed to be a very good approximation of, of the area under f prime, but I'm just a bad drawer, so it doesn't look like this one. Uh, but that says, remember that each rectangle is very small. So let's go to the next step. On each piece, what we had, we considered the rectangle, but the point is we did it on each piece. And the point is, in the end, we get a bunch of rectangles, right? Because for each piece, we get a rectangle, and then the point is, this is the graph of f, f prime. We get this rectangle here, a rectangle here, rectangle here, da da da. And each point is choose a random point. And the point is, this is supposed, as I said, this is supposed to be a very good approximation of, you know, the area under F. So, if what you really want to approximate the area is you want to take the sum of the areas of each rectangle. So, it's x0, x1, xi minus 1, xi, xn, and remember, as I said, the area is, you know, delta x times f prime of x i star. So now, to get the total area, what you want to do is you sum all those rectangles. So take sum of areas. Then you get, again, in summation notation, the sum from 1 to n of delta x times f prime of x i star. So, as I said, each rectangle has area. Delta x times f prime x i star. You take the sum of it, and the point is, you get a good approximation, and to get a better and better approximation, you just take many, you chop more and more pieces. In other words, you let the width go to zero, which is mathematically expressed as you take the limit as n goes to infinity of that sum. Okay. And this is, by definition, the integral. We define this to be the integral from a to b of f prime of x dx. So all this time I've spent on defining the integral, 
but it is not the time lost because this is actually very crucial to prove the fundamental theme of calculus, at least the way I would prove it. Of course, you might say, I object, and I overrule this objection, because you might say that, uh, well, doesn't this limit depend on the choice of your xi star? Remember, I said you can choose any xi star you want. It turns out that if this function f prime is continuous, that limit is independent of your choice of x i star. So you can choose, literally choose any point in that little interval and still get the same limit. And you may say, hey, this is weird, but it's not very weird because if this function f prime is continuous, then on each little rectangle, it doesn't move very much. So the values of f prime don't change much on this interval. So if you just choose another point nearby, the, the answer in the end shouldn't change either. But of course, this is a very informal statement. To prove this, you have to you know, use a bunch of epsilons and deltas, but not today. <laughs> today is not an epsilon delta day. But <laughs> this is, as I said, this is a definition of the integral. And you know, if we want to prove the fundamental theorem of calculus, we want to have some relationship between f prime and f. That said, now if you remember your calculus and go all the way back, uh, there's actually another theorem that talks about the relationship between f prime and f. And I don't mean to be rude, but I value your time because we will talk about the mean value theorem. So, so step four, and now again recall, by the MVT, so it's like the VMP, but with a T, so by the mean value theorem, what do we have? We actually have that on each little interval, xi minus 1 and xi can actually compare, if you like, the values of f of xi minus 1 and f of xi. Namely, what does the mean value theorem say? It says that there's some point C in that interval such that the slope of the line connecting this point and this point is actually equal to the derivative of f at that point. And the slope here, f prime of c, so by the mean value theorem, there is some c. There is c in the interval xi minus 1 and xi, Such that, what do we have? f of xi minus f of xi minus 1 over xi minus xi minus 1 equals to f prime of c. Okay. Let's clean this up a little bit. Well, this xi minus xi minus 1 is precisely the length of the interval. It's delta x. So what do we have? We have f of xi minus f of xi minus 1 over delta x equals to f prime of c. And now remember, here comes the most important part of the proof. Well, this point c, it actually depends on i because it's in that interval, but this point c is very valuable. It gives us a lot of information relating f and f prime. But remember, in our definition of the interval, we're allowed to choose any point in that interval to define our integral. So, because that point is so special, let's just choose that point c. So let xi star be that c equals to c. Then, we have, we have the following very important formula, f of xi minus f of xi minus 1 over delta x equals to f prime of xi star. In other words, so remember this sum involves delta x f prime of xi star that actually equals to this little thing, that's this little sucker. 
minus f of x i minus 1 equals to delta x f prime of x i star. And now that we have this nice identity, which looks almost like FTC-like, let's just plug this in into this formula. So, if you want the step 5, grand finale, so this is educational, you learn about this proof, and you learn about Riemann integration, so it's the beauty of math. Well, integral from a to b of f prime of x dx, that equals to the limit as n goes to infinity of sum from 1 to n uh, delta x f prime of x star. Let's see if I can write this on one line. So let's put a bit of spice in this theorem. So what do we have? Well, look, we have this magic formula. So let's just plug this in. That's equal to limit n goes to infinity. Sum from 1 to i from 1 to n of f of xi minus f of xi minus 1. Well, let's just calculate what this sum is. So it's limit n goes to infinity of. So if i is 1, that's f of x1 minus f of x0 plus the next sum is f of x2 minus f of x1 plus f of x3 minus f of x2 plus etc, etc. And you go all the way to f of xn minus f of xn minus 1. But look, here's a really big explosion happening because this f of x1 cancels this f of x2 cancels, and if you continue, the f of x3 cancels, and everything cancels except for the first term and the last term. So, sorry, I didn't write it in one line, but uh, almost. It's too exciting to fill one blackboard, so let's do it on two blackboards. Then we get limit n goes to infinity of f. After all this explosion, as I said, what's left is the last term and the first term. But here's the nice thing. We know what xn is. xn is just b, and x0 is a. So we have limit n goes to infinity of f of b minus f of a, but this does not depend on n. It's like a constant. And in fact, we're left with f of b minus f of a. And here we are fundamentally proved the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Because if you go back in this line, we've shown that integral from a to b of f prime of x dx equals to f of b minus f of a. And we did not use any epsilons and deltas. Woo! Wow. <laughs> yeah. Woo. Thank you, thank you. And then the box is much bigger today. Why? It is, because it's very exciting. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, thank you. Payan, say something huh? about the price. We are hungry. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh mon dieu. Oh my god. Ay, Dios mio. Ay, dad, be dad.